Welcome, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining us for another Sparking Creativity podcast here at uh, CreatorWorks Makerspace. Uh, it's been a little while, but uh, we're back on the horse and getting things done. So I have two new folks to kind of introduce you to today. Um, and the first one I'm going to introduce is uh, is one of our uh, awesome, awesome partners and um, our, our marketing coordinator, uh, Atlas. Um, she is here, and Alice, why don't I uh, let you tell the folks what you do here and how you're involved with CreatorWorks. Oh goodness, what do I not do here? Um, yep. I got involved as a subcontractor with CreatorWorks, just kind of helping with small business incubation, doing some basic uh, tasks associated with uh, operations optimization, really like organizational mm -hmm. stuff, doing some marketing, PR, and just kind of hanging out in the communities and talking about what it means to represent and be a member of a makerspace. So if you guys see Alice pop up on uh, our Facebook page or for uh, any of the community pages, uh, she's been, she's been doing a lot of work, uh, reaching out to folks, talking to people um, and been doing uh, just a bang up job with getting the word out about um, us here at CreateWorks and also what a makerspace is. Uh, which kind of leads me into our, our other guest, or our, rather our proper guest, I should say, uh, Ryan Wilcoxon, who's here. Uh, and Ryan is the executive director at Talent Maker City, which is uh, just down the road from us in Talent. And um, Talent Maker City has been in operation a little bit longer than CreatorWorks. And Ryan, why don't I let you uh, introduce uh, yourself and Talent and uh, TMC and the whole community there. Sure, thanks uh, first for having me, this is fun. Um, yeah, my name's Ryan Wilcox, I'm a founding member of Talent Maker City, um, our chair for a while, and now I am the executive director. I've been ED, this is my uh, second year being ED, um, when we finally got the ability to pay people for staff positions and it wasn't all volunteer, because that's how it worked the first couple of years. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, we're, uh, we've been around for about four and a half years, um, moved into our space uh, last, last uh, gosh, the end of, the middle of 19, oh no, middle of 18, middle of 18. Uh, all kind of blurred together now, doesn't I know. it? Uh, opened up for uh, workshops in the shop in January of 19. Uh, that was followed by memberships. Uh, and then we were doing, um, uh, after school programming, summer camp programming um, cool. for middle and high school kids and elementary. And then right. in October, we opened up for, for memberships. Um, so kind of the, <clears throat> that memberships was the last part of the um, kind of the, the puzzle that we put together. And uh, yeah, we're, we're going strong until March or so. <laughs> um, and then we just kind of, uh, you know, we had to shut down because for obvious reasons. Um, and then that like led into a whole other adventure. Yeah. It so. seems to start like filling in the blanks though from what I've been seeing because little known fact, I do live in town. So I do know that city of makers and I get to see you guys pretty regularly. But it seems like once the shutdown happened, you guys were pretty quick to figure out how you were going to fill in the blanks, do your outreach programs, and then really step up to kind of fill some of the other gaps within the, the general causes of shutdown, that kind of thing. Yeah. So, you know, in the several years prior to COVID shutdowns starting to happen, we have established a lot of uh, partnerships with various businesses, uh, education, um, health, all, all these things through our uh, summer programming, through workshops, all sorts of stuff. So when we decided to shut down, which was pretty early, it was mid-March, um, right when it got bad, um, we, we, Ali and I are basically, Ali, Allison French, our, our programs director, we took, a, I think it was a three-day weekend, a Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Saturday afternoon, we got wind that there was dire need of, of masks. Mm -hmm. um, so we started arranging that, assembling our group of um, fiber artists who worked with us to, to figure out a way to, to make the fabric masks thing work. And this was kind of before they became standard. It was, is this gonna do anything? Is it worth doing? Is it gonna harm anything? So we kind of yeah. entered it. You know, we jumped right in, but we were a little trepidatious, making sure we want to do it right the first time. Mm -hmm. um, and then a few days after that, uh, Asante and uh, 
well, actually, a few days after that, we were approached by um, a guy named Brad Converse from up in uh, Grants Pass, who was putting together a group that turned into the STEAM, uh, not STEAM, the uh, COVID Skunk Works uh, group, which is right. ended up being about 50 engineers, makers, business leaders, uh, uh, government leadership, uh, all working to solve this very acute, very pressing uh, PPE shortage. So um, once we heard that was a problem and 3D printing was a solution, um, we just went full gas on that uh, because we could. Mm -hmm. um, we're not a big uh, lumbering giant corporation or, or whatever. We're, we're a small makerspace and we have all the tools. We have the people mm -hmm. um, yeah. working with us already. So we were able to totally shift gears and direct all our resources to the PPE production and um, doing that with the COVID Skunk Works team with who is working directly with Asante to vet designs, um, mm -hmm. uh, test prototypes, all that kind of stuff. Um, so it was, uh, I, I forget where, where I started on that Atlas, but yeah. um, that, that's basically how it was. It was yeah. Uh, in my curiosity specifically, because I'm in a few different groups online, especially with outreach, that kind of thing. And there is a 3D printing for women group that they are really, really adamant about 3D printing PPE. And I, when I first got into that group, I was like, how are we, like, are we printing math? Like, what is this? And I realized it's actually the ear savers at, on the top that make it so it doesn't like pull on your ears a bunch. And they were talking about some other, other elements that as makers that they were building to fill in those gaps. And I'm just curious, mm -hmm. what were the things you guys were specifically making? Is it the little bands on the back that are yeah. the savers? Was there anything else you guys were making? Yeah, it was, it was, it started with, uh, I believe it started with the face shield brackets that Prusa oh. um, had the basic bare bones, um, just that little strip basically. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> we presented that to Asante and they said, we, it won't work in our in our scenario because of the um, aerosolized fluids. I think it's called basically when people cough or sneeze or breathe. Mm -hmm. you know, right. They needed half or just fluids, blood. Yeah. Yeah. They needed a shield like that that kind of wrapped back behind their head to prevent stuff from settling between the face and the shield. So mm -hmm. we adapted that design and started printing those. It took about they're they're now being. Um, uh, Injection molded, which of course cool. you can do a thousand a day versus sixteen a day. Um, so, but there was a good felt like a, a month maybe yeah, where that month that month wasn't month. a possibility. <clears throat> we were finding people who could do it, who had the capacity to tool up and do it. But mm -hmm. yes, yeah, so they ended up using the, the mass that we for the, or the face shield brackets that, that we were printing to do their mold and. Now everybody has plenty of them. So we were doing that. We did the ear savers. Those are those are pretty easy. We just grabbed a file <coughs> uh, somewhere on Thingiverse or something. But we were also doing prototyping uh, ventilator valves. So oh, so uh, little the ventilators they had that normally serve regular capacity would serve one person. So we were making four port and six port. Um, expansions I guess that would yeah. adapt those to serve six people or four people or whatever with inline like a, like a manifold right yeah it's a manifold so with yeah with inline um, uh, uh, gates or valves uh, to control who gets they need different pressures of oxygen and you know I don't mm. know about that but all those designs were going through Asante and, and getting vetted as as they were coming in so sometimes we would we would start three designs throughout the day start one in the morning mm -hmm. get word at 11 that that's not going to work cat up another design start squeezing filament <laughs> through the yeah. hot end to, to make that and then get another uh revision at four o'clock cat it up put it on the, the machine and come back tomorrow morning and hope it works um, well, that's a really that's a really great example of like um how 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 handy 3d printing it is and how like how interesting um that in like kind of this digital day and age where you can design something in a computer you can go from 
you can do three iterations of a product in a day, whereas, you know, before, before that, yeah. you know, oh, I got to like, I got to carve this wax thing and do an injection mold and yep. like, you know, and then it, it was a week before you had a product and then you had to vet it and then you had to look at it and then you had to redesign it. But now it's, yeah. oh, I have a, I have a thing I'm going to start, I'm going to try this, you know, I'm just going to try this right now because it's a, you know, it's a, it's pennies of uh, worth of, of 3d print filament and I can, yeah. I can run it. I can see if it works. If it doesn't work, I can go back and, you know, be printing a new one in, in, in a few hours. And that's exactly how we were doing it. We, we approached early on, we knew the capacity was going to be bigger, was going to be greater than, I think we had three Prusa, uh, uh, MK at Mark three S's, um, mm. two of them were working. Uh, so we, we knew that wasn't going to cut it. So we approached um, so, uh, funder who, who we'd worked with in the past for an emergency grant that helped us get three um, Ultimakers. Two of them were dual filament, which was really critical for um, for the uh, those manifolds because they needed breakaway parts in order to let those valves turn and stuff. So we were doing the TPU, uh, sorry, PL, uh, PLA, PVA, uh, and the PVA would be dissolved away for all sorts of things from uh, that to uh, breathing apparatus, mm -hmm. um, inline filters that, that, you know, those filters became unavailable all of a sudden, but we had things like this, <clears throat> these ubiquitous uh, uh, 3M filters. So we designed housing. Uh, one of the engineers who, who we work with here, uh, catted that up and so now these were readily available and they have the same filtration as the medical ones so there again we were able to, to rapidly um, yeah. prototype that and go through many iterations and, I, and that's hard to do guys, and you guys are kind of able to like you guys were able to kind of bridge the gap between um you know uh, at the start of things when there was when there was very little ppe available and things like you know the filter holders and things like that uh, to the point where uh, larger entities, larger companies and things like that could tool up and yeah. make them injection molded forms and things like that to where, you know, you, got, you guys were able to kind of bridge the gap. That's really, um, that's a really interesting and awesome uh, kind of segue into what, uh, if we, we could kind of talk about like what a maker space is because um, as I dropped my pen, <laughs> um, it's, you know, a makerspace is kind of more than just like a set of shops, right? It's, it's, it's a community of people. And Ryan, I think you and, um, and your partners there have kind of done a really awesome job of, of building that community and building that, um, uh, that, that, uh, group of people around, around talent maker city. Um, could you, could you talk about that a little bit and, and like kind of how, how you guys started and what, what you kind of think of, as uh, what TMC is as yeah. a makerspace? Yeah. Um, so TMC and CreatorWorks kind of had started at opposite ends and are working kind of towards the same place. We, yeah. for two years, didn't have a space. So we were doing workshops and outreach um, and summer camps everywhere else from uh, Talent Middle School, Ashen Woodshop, Wine Bar, Goat Farm, all sorts mm -hmm. of stuff. Um, and in doing that, having to really lay that foundation of, of uh, building community partners, doing a ton of education, which I know you guys are doing too, just explaining what a makerspace is, how people can utilize it, why it's important to, I would argue, every community. Um, yeah. uh, so that, that's, that's largely how we now have, I think, a really solid network of, of people who are involved, not necessarily all makers, but people who... Um, can play other roles, whether it's business mm -hmm. making connections or business sending their employees to get trained or just have some fun time, you know, that type of thing. So um, the, whole, the whole COVID thing really highlighted how important a maker, a, like a thriving maker ecosystem is, is in, any, in any community. Yeah. Because you can tool up quickly to respond to these gaps, like you said, um, mm -hmm. whereas, you know, bigger, bigger businesses with, with uh, different bottom lines and things like that mm -hmm. can't necessarily do or have the capacity. You can't just abandon a $300,000 run of 
injection molded whatever to to make three thousand face shields. I mean, you could, but you might go out of business. <laughs> right. Uh, yeah. So that's where we were able to to mobilize as our network of makers. We immediately uh, built out a section of our website that hosted all of the um, the current, the the approved, the vetted approved three D uh, SDLs or G code. I can't remember mm-hmm. what we were. No, it must have been SDLs. Um, for all our our network of makers, we had 3D printers at home to, to crank out. So we had, um, I think, 100 people getting a newsletter, all, not quite daily, um, with the latest designs. And then we would receive, you guys had the collection box at the at, the, at your shop. We had them up in Grants Pass, mm-hmm. Adam and Talent. And we, were just, we were collecting hundreds and hundreds of, of printed face shields or, or whatever was doing we were doing mm-hmm. from the community and that's that's the important thing is the thriving maker ecosystem and you know the people who wanted desperately to help but had no way to do it to 3d print babysit a printer and right so that was big one of my favorite things in witnessing these like maker spaces come and like fully blossom in many communities especially here in southern oregon is the fact that it really does drive these people that have the the earnest energy to be able to like oh i want to help i know i can do something yeah. and it's really connecting the dots because the amount of makers that i meet or are just generally in my own network that are like shade tree mechanics or we work during yeah. like butt crack a dawn so it's not yeah. super hot out and then you talk to some of them and you're like, well, hey, and I'm lucky enough that I'm associated with a 10,000 square foot shop. So it's like, mm-hmm. hey, I know your tree at home is really nice, but have you plugged in with your local maker space? Have you seen- we, have these, we have these things called concrete floors. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I don't mind around around on. Okay. And roll up doors. I'm jealous of your roll up doors. Yeah. Yes. yeah. We're okay. genuinely lucky here for that kind of stuff. Yeah. The facility is just, you know, it's, it's a building that really houses yeah family of makers and I know on your intake form and this is called sparking creativity it's that idea of like what drives your creativity what sparks it and you were talking about having to solve a problem like deadlines really really coming up with creative new ways to solve problems and I think maker spaces within communities in this day and age of COVID is probably really tantalizing to you personally because you're like oh like I have to figure out these problems. And we don't even yep. know if the deadline is four o'clock today because things change so quickly. And yep. you as a community on your feet. And I think it's a really great way as we're isolated to still stay connected. It's true. It's true. It's a shame. It's so a shame that we're, we're still shut down right now um, because people are chomping at the bit to get back in and we want to have them back in. Like the people yeah. who base their business out of here, whether it's screen printing or, uh, making cabinets for vans and stuff. <clears throat> they need our space because they don't have the tools or the space of their own to, to do all this or the support. You know, yeah. um, I know a lot about screen printing. It was my first job in high school. So I I trained two people who now have small businesses that are, you know, they're not making 100000 a year or anything like that, but it's it's a good side hustle yeah, totally. and so yeah it's it's just uh, an invaluable community resource whether it's just engaging with different people with different ideas uh, sharing those ideas and being inspired by the person working next to you like the, the fiber artist who might inform something that the ceramicist is doing and that's mm. that's the cross-pollination that's so important and yeah. just reminds us reminds people that we can make stuff we can fix stuff we don't have to buy garbage throw it away buy it again and ad nauseum Mm -hmm. Um, that's i think really important to to rediscover our self-reliance and especially in southern oregon you know we just we do we we handle our stuff yep but we need to always be reminded especially the, the the youngsters who are growing up in front of a screen it's not necessarily a bad thing, but engaging different parts of their brains to stoke interest in STEAM mm-hmm. pathways, whether that's higher education or uh, yep. straight into the workforce. That's just uh, makerspace is critical, or maker ecosystem, I would say. 
Mm -hmm. yeah. I think it's really cool with your guys' STEAM program specifically because addressing distance learning and a lot of kids are spending a yeah. lot more time in front of the computer of like, cool, you can be in front of a computer, but we're still going to have you shake up that two liter bottle and go yep. play with your rocket outside because yep. especially with physical sciences, which is a great thing during the summertime, it's like, this isn't all 100% online. We, we know that this is the tool that we are meant in like, supposed to be using but it's not the only one at disposal you have all of outside you have all of hands-on and i yep. think one of the connecting things between creative works and talent maker city is we both do outreach with the local school districts because it is very important to bring that hands-on kinetic style learning back into classrooms and get oh. people excited about what they can do with their own like mind body combination with tools at their at their whim it's so important, and that was really important for us as we were, you know, hatching the idea of how to do distance learning uniquely in a way that we could quick, very, very quickly tool up and, and pull it off. Yeah. And that was, that was it, is getting um, kids outside when we could, whether it's the rockets, whether it's our gardening mm -hmm. um, uh, camp, whether it's a uh, treasure hunt where they're out learning how to triangulate, read a, read a compass and find treasure that we've buried every day in local <laughs> parks <laughs> mm -hmm. um, it's rad and it's all got an implied math focus we built a whole uh, learning management system front end to deliver all this stuff and that keeps we can do pre-testing which is data that we need uh, mm -hmm. or that our schools need uh, so that they can do this again or we use for grants and stuff like that so but everything is all applied math they're learning math grade level appropriate math with all these activities and um, yeah, you know, it's the reality and frankly, a lot of the online virtual stuff that's being rolled out by schools is their um, two hour worksheets, lectures yeah. and worksheets for, for yeah. sixth grader, seventh grader. They're, I get it, they're building on a model that's been in place for 50, 60, 100 yeah. years or whatever, but we do five, five to 10 minute videos, get mm -hmm. in, you get out. And then in the evening, yeah. if you're having trouble with something, we have live support with each of the instructors. So the um, way, uh, the way Sam Steele, the, the, um, the uh, school superintendent here in school district six describes it is the, the schools and the school districts are, are, are huge, huge container ship. And it takes an immense amount of force to turn that shit. Yeah. You know? turn around and, and, and adjust. And the cool thing that, you know, the, 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 the cool ability that we have here at creative works and the cool ability that you have there are all of these, um, all of these ways to think outside of that box and, and we're, we're, we're nimble, we're fast, we're, we can prototype stuff really quick and cheaply. And we can kind of, we can kind of turn on that dime, whereas the school district doesn't necessarily have that capacity. So, you know, where, you know, if, if teachers like have an idea for, you know, uh, a curriculum that they want to pull off, all they got to do is, all they have to do is reach out to us and say, Hey, this is my idea. How can we make this work? And we can, we can, we have, you know, staff and, and you guys have, you know, staff and, and we can kind of brainstorm it and think of it and like prototype something and, you know, in a day and, and that, oh, that doesn't work. Then we try another thing for another day and, you know, we can kind of, yep. um, we can kind of, turn on that dime whereas the school districts are a little bit a little bit more heavy-handed yeah and um, school districts don't need to turn on a dime they don't need no. to move that whole ship as the makers we just take the kids out on the little dinghies for like day trips and then we bring them yeah. back <laughs> we yeah, always like come that. back to the cool lessons but we take them yeah. on a cool little adventure yep mm -hmm. and they're going to need a lot of those adventures while they're holed up in, in house mm -hmm. um but yeah you're uh, it's also um it's a willingness uh, for, for our organizations and our staff to just take big chances and risk failing because we will in some capacity, but you know, we've worked hard enough to cultivate that safe uh, environment to fail in. So that fail fast and hard and frequently and figure it out. Figure it out is kind of our, our motto, but that, that's another thing is, is having that environment where you can fail. You can't really do that as freely in a job where you're getting paid or yeah. uh, if you're a teacher meeting standards, mm -hmm. um, all that stuff. But, but we can, we 
kind of a kind of a kind of a motto in business you know it's it's fail small and fail often right yeah yeah, yeah. and um you know we've been doing that since literally day one that's we're, we're same here pretty comfortable with it at this point it's still stressful as heck, uh, as heck. yeah <laughs> but um absolutely yeah so yeah it, that, that's it's stressful but it's reason. Yeah, it, it's something. It's it's something we all need to do, and we all need to get kind of comfortable comfortable with. And mm-hmm. you know, I, I think a lot in our in in my experiences growing up as you know a, a quote unquote smart kid. Um, I don't know what that ever meant really, but Me either um, it was the same yeah. thing. <laughs> Boy, was, was I like, proud to get that little badge. But <laughs> you know, the, the one of the things you kind of learn. I, I learned in my experience. I, don't, I can't. Exp- I can't. You know. You know, uh, I can't speak to anybody else's experience, but um, I didn't necessarily right out the gate learn how to fail and you know how how to fail safely and how to like Either. how to go big. You know, it, it was it was always like, oh, I didn't, I didn't, I got a D on that te- on that chem test. Oh, the world's kind of over now. You know, yeah, and so in seventh grade, and you just screwed your chances to go to college, pal. <laughs> it was, no, it was so much. Not, that's not a good I know. Thing at all, you know, I know. I was on all those college tracks, the whatever gifted tracks and Mm -hmm. it was the same thing there was so much pressure to stay you know on course and i Mm -hmm. resent that i didn't take wood shop i didn't take auto shop any of that in high school um, Mm -hmm. because i was taking ap history where i learned one version of history that didn't end up doing anything for me in film school Yep. So, and I will say, like, again, coming back to maker spaces, like, I didn't do, I mean, I didn't even have shop offered when I went through high school and middle school and that kind of thing. So it kind of was, well, do this form of academia, get into college, that kind of thing. And I went to school for politics, and I still prefer to hammer away quite literally on just, like, my own personal projects, because mm-hmm. I think I'm just carving my own path and you know being within a community of people that understand the concept of prototyping trying and failing and being yeah. able to encourage each other to each other to then learn from those failures and keep going that's one of the most life-giving things about communities within the makerspace ecosystem yeah you open yourself up to so many different opportunities and just stand in your lane uh on uh whatever maybe you're, that lane earns you three hundred thousand a year and you're set but is but, that the point <laughs> I don't know. I, I prefer a, you know, a little bit of everything. Yeah. Well, Brian, learning. Real yeah. quick, if you want to plug anything before we get going, we're just running out mm-hmm. of a, a little bit of my record time right now. So I want to give everyone a heads up. You can totally follow mm-hmm. Talent Maker City at Talent Maker City, no spaces on both Facebook and Instagram. They've got some really, really cool ways to plug in, and I'm sure Ryan has some other things that you can expand upon as well. Sure. Uh, I wish we had a date um, to, uh, that were reopening uh, that I could share, but, but we don't. Um, we are head down doing um, uh, this online, creating, building this online learning uh, library of videos and, and curriculum. Um, but if you stay, stay up to date on uh, Facebook, or Instagram or subscribe to our newsletter, you'll, you'll be apprised of all the news and announcements that, that um, you know, whatever the next, whatever the next couple months brings, yeah. uh, we'll be adapting and keep everybody up to date. So um, yeah, I wish I had some events and stuff. We usually do workshops, okay. whatever, but. We're just gonna use that as an excuse to follow, to unfollow and then we follow you on Instagram, okay. just so you get that notification. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Hit that, hit that, uh, hit that uh, newsletter up too. Yeah, you can do that at talentmakercity.org slash newsletter. Um, you can find just about everything at .org. Super. Uh, yeah. Cool. Well, th- Ryan, thank you so much for joining us and, uh, and, and hanging out. And um, I, I look forward to, to seeing you guys, you know, what, what you're producing. And I'm looking forward to seeing you guys opening back up too. Uh, at some point, um, but we will, we'll, we'll, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll, and we'll be right there with you and, and kind of trying to, trying to build this, build this maker ecosystem. I love, I'm going to, I'm going to totally steal that. Okay. <laughs> but thank you so much. Yeah. Thank and, you. Uh, Atlas, thank you for joining us, uh, for the 
Atlas is uh, first time on the podcast, so uh, thanks for thanks for hooking it up. And um, yeah, this this was a great conversation. I really really appreciate it and appreciate you both. Yeah. Likewise, Thank thanks for having me. It's fun uh, anytime. Let's do it yeah. again. Absolutely. We'll we'll hold you to that for sure. All right. All right. Adios, y'all. Ciao.